This week on The Futurists, Eric Edmeads. We're living in the easiest, safest, best times in the history of Earth for the individual person on Earth today. The easier life gets, the harder it is to live it. Welcome back to The Futurists. If you've been following the journey of the Futurist podcast, uh, you'll know that we uh, have been running this show for about a year. We have a great milestone to share with you. We just crossed uh, half a million downloads for the show. So yeah, yeah it's great to uh, to see that progress. So um, joining me in the hosting chair today, of course, is my uh, co-host, Rob Tersek. Rob? Hi. Good morning. How are you? We're both great. at home, but we're in, on different continents. Good to I see you. Know- yeah, I don't know when I'm going to get back to the states right now. I'm still waiting for my uh, for the the U.S. embassy to issue my visa. It's just have to wait for the next election, <laughs> probably. <laughs> yeah, they. You know, I like I remember coming into um, JFK one time, and uh, I had my TSA pre um, revoked. Oh, and I and I remember asking the the you know, the customs and border guy, you know, what's going on? You know, what, why is my, my status being provoked? He's like, right to Trump. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I don't think that's really practical advice, brother, but thanks anyway. Um, so this week, uh, Rob, um, you know, some, some interesting things happening. Um, obviously, uh, market's still in a bit of turmoil. The BRIC announcement, I don't know if you saw that, that Saudi and um, Iran and a bunch of other company, countries being admitted to the BRIC nations now, which now means that the BRIC nations um, produce more GDP than uh, the G7. Hmm. So, That's an interesting thing. We'll see if much comes from that. That organization hasn't really done much in the past. There's a bit of tension between India and China that oh, prevents yeah, sure. them from being very effective. Sure. So, uh, no, it, I, it I was, mean, but I do think that these unconventional alliances and so forth are seeing, you know, that's it's easier to do now. Yeah. The tech is easier, so forth. And there's a fairly, um, you know, China's made some pretty good points about you don't want to be aligned with the US dollar because if you're relying on the US dollar as a reserve currency and the US decides to sanction you, you know, you're screwed. Well, yeah, that's bad for China, of yeah. course. Um, and reality, uh, China's worried go? about that if they do something in Taiwan. But anyway, it's been interesting hey, to see. Hey, Brett, it, if know, the Indians agree to adopt the yuan as reserve currency, I'll buy you dinner at the restaurant of your choice. All right. Well, and I don't think they're necessarily going to adopt the e one, but I think we could see a wholesale CBDC that's a, a brick standard. Sure. So, okay, well, that will but, be in the future if it the, comes. Yeah, it'll be. Yeah, but, but I mean, you know, automated supply chain is in the future. Right. But we know it's going to happen and you need programmable money. So it'll be interesting. Interesting to see where this goes. Anyway, let's get to our guest. Um, we have an interesting uh, guest on on today. Um, we're going to talk about his books. Um, uh, he He's uh, he's an entrepreneur. Um, but, you know, probably in terms of the conversation we're going to have today, a lot more of it is about his work in terms of uh, sociology, anthropology, looking at um, how humans uh, humans behave and, you know, what we have learned as human tribes and so forth in the past that we've maybe forgotten now. Um, he does this through, you know, visiting actually with tribes in Africa and the Amazon and so forth. It's super interesting. So uh, let's, let's get him on. Eric Edmeads, welcome to The Futurists. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. Hi, Eric. It's great to see you. Now you're, uh, so, you're in the uh, DR today, right? I am. I'm in the Dominican Republic, home. Yeah, and you, but you spend a ton of time traveling, like all of us. But uh, uh, yeah, I'm I'm probably on the road about half half the time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and your your show has a huge carbon footprint. I was thinking about I that know. the other day. Everyone's always flying someplace. Yeah, uh, we got to do something about that. Maybe, but you know, like carbon you know, offsets are getting a really bad name right now. We need something better, right? Yeah. We need to just get rid of carbon, I guess. I guess is the is the message. But so, Eric, like like um, like Brett said in the intro, your background is as an entrepreneur in tech and mobile, and also here in Hollywood in special effects. Um, yeah. But you've developed this. You've kind of cultivated this interest in social anthropology and the and the uh, evolutionary history of of societies. How did you come about that? Like, how did that occur? Yeah. How did you go from ILM to this? <laughs> It went from, you know, I, I guess uh, 
when I was in um, in in business, just doing my thing, I I I had curiosities that were that you know sort of stepped outside the technology realm that I was in, and one of them was frankly that I was sick. You know, I was I was quite frequently sick, and and I and and I mean like I was on medications and visiting specialists on a regular basis, and and I wasn't getting anywhere. In fact, the latest recommendation I'd had at twenty one was to you know involved surgery, and and. I weirdly, I, I went to like what I thought was a business seminar. And then uh, on the last day of the business seminar, they talked a lot about food and I'd never really talked to anybody about food. I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't like heavily overweight. I wasn't, I didn't think of food, you know, I did, but some of the ideas that were discussed kind of intrigued me. And so I, I decided to kind of just experiment a little bit. And 30 days later, I'd lost 35 pounds and every symptom I had was gone. Like I, I was an entirely yeah. different human being yeah. and my doctor's do office called food. me. What was that? Yeah, we should do a, sh a show about food and nutrition. I got to tell you, it's it's it might be the single most important. Um, uh, it might be more important than anything else that we're we're discussing at the moment because it, it's the, at the foundation of it all. And 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 to that end, I, I my doctor called me to confirm my surgery, and I said I don't think I need the surgery anymore. Like I'm I'm fine now. And they're like, no, that happens with things like this. It it gets better, but then you know, in the last thing you want to do is end up back on the. I'm I'm from Canada, right? So we have free medical. It just might be three years from now. So he's like, you don't want to wait on the waiting list again. It was like, a, it was like a used car salesman trying to talk me out of canceling the purchase. And so I, I no kidding. You can imagine 21, I looked about 14 and it must've been very impetuous looking to this doctor, but I said to him, um, how long did you go to medical school for? And he said, six years. And I said, so, you know, in the six years, how much that time did you spend studying nutrition? And he, and he cocked his head to one side, like, you know, like a confused dog. And he's like, what? What kind of question is that? What's and, that got to said, do with medicine? Yeah. He said none. He had, he had none. And so at that point, I I kind of felt like I was in a plane with a pilot who'd never been taught to land, you know, so hold on a second now. Yeah. And and so I started at that point um, studying food and and and, and history. And, and it really, it, it hit home to me one day when I started, I was reading an article about elephants and the comparative lifespans of elephants in captivity versus elephants in the wild. And the article kept referring to the elephant's wild diet versus their captive diet. And as a bit of a grammar, I'm a little bit of a grammar fascist sometimes, I, 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 which is odd because I'm dyslexic, but what the hell? And I, it, it irritated me that they kept putting the word wild, the word wild diet. It, it, that irritated me. That's not the elephant's wild diet. It's their naturally evolved diet. They have mm. a captive diet and a naturally evolved diet, not a wild diet. And this thought on a plane, no kidding, flying to South Africa hit me. And I realized that's where we need to be looking. We need to be looking at our naturally evolved relationship mm. with food. What's and the so wild diet for humans like? Well, you know, it, it, it's seasonal. And that's one of the big things that people don't really understand is that there is no, if people often ask me, what's the perfect meal today? It depends on the season. And I don't mean the season that you're living in. I mean, the season that your DNA evolved in, right? The, the, the season that your digestive system optimized for, you know, you have a season that's particularly geared at gaining weight. It's supposed to do that to make sure you get through the right. drought. But then you have a season for letting go of that weight. And the average American never visits that season. And, and so it, <laughs> it, it becomes a very yeah, uh, yeah. fascinating conversation. And then that led to, I was running these leadership programs where I would take people up Kilimanjaro mm. as, a, as a mental toughness and leadership exercise. And I came down from the mountain one day and my logistics partner said, listen, I feel like maybe you should meet some of the, the, the Hadza people we have here. And, and I'm, what, what, what would he, and, and I was so intrigued because I've been fascinated by the Khoisan Bushmen that you might've seen in the movie, The Gods Must Be Crazy. I've yeah. been so fascinated by that lifestyle and I didn't know they still lived like that. And I went to go visit with them. And now for 15 years, I've been, I've been visiting them on a regular basis. It's been life-changing. So what is the name of the tribe again? Hadza or Hadzabe. They, it depends. They, they don't, our language is a little different than theirs, but okay. commonly and where Hadza. are they? Are they in Kenya or somewhere nearby? Yeah, they're they're actually in Tanzania, very close to Kenya. Nice. They're 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 uh, they're near the Ngorongoro Conservancy area in a place I, called. I've Lake always Yacht. wanted to visit Tanzania. You know, that's, I mean, that's I, a very remember, old place, right? That's like yeah, the, I remember the origin as a, of humanity. As a kid, you know, my my, fa my most memorable project I did as a as a kid at, at primary school was this big poster I did on Tanzania. So, well, yeah, funny enough, you, you guys might know Mark Hyman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm taking Mark to go visit with the Hadza in November, and uh, and part of that trip we're going to the Olduvai Gorge, which is maybe the most important pale paleoanthropological site in the world, where the Leakey's yeah. work has all been on display, and then we're going to the Ngorongoro Crater, which I kid you not, I believe is the genesis of the Garden of Eden, and I really believe that. And and I and thought it's, on it's where basis. they get the vibranium. 
it, it's yeah, that's right. It's, it's a little like that, but it's um, it was a volcano the size of almost Kilimanjaro, and millions of years ago, it caved in and left this like Peter Jackson style wall, twenty miles around, and inside there are lakes and river and, and rivers and and elephants and lions and what have you, and it's a walled garden. Mm-hmm. So it's it it really feels like the cradle of really the cradle of mankind and the cradle of all of our stories. And what did you learn there? What are the things that you took away from that encounter or your later meetings? You know, um, at first, because I was so focused on food and and mm-hmm. but let's say health, I I mostly that's what I paid attention to. I I paid I looked at the way they ate. I asked a lot about seasonal fluctuation. I looked at their daily movement patterns and that kind of stuff. And so what I learned there is stuff that we all pretty much know at this point, and that is that. Um, you know, we, we don't eat enough of the good stuff and we eat too much of the bad stuff and we don't move our bodies enough. I mean, I know you don't have to go all the way to Africa to learn that, but you know, there's this uh, old Chinese expression that to know and not to do is not to know. So I suggest that the average person knows this, but they don't know it. Mm-hmm. And so to go and actually see it, it, I mean, on an average day, these guys go 10 to 20 miles a day to satisfy their basic nutritional requirements. So let me give mm-hmm. you an example of something I call the evolution gap. And that is, um, your cardiovascular system has a pump. It, 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 as a matter of fact, it has two. You have your diaphragm to pump air. You have your heart to, to pump blood. That's because oxygen is so urgent that you need it to pump. Your lymphatic system doesn't have a pump. And, and, and you know, it's, it's, it's the difference between urgency and importance. Your lymphatic system is incredibly important. You need lymph to flow around you. If you don't have lymph flowing around, you will die. It's very important, mm-hmm. but it's not urgent. And so you didn't evolve a pump for it because your daily requirement for movement to satisfy your most basic needs as a human caused you to contract and relax your muscles, which pump lymph around. Now let's take a look at the average person living in the modern world today. They're not using the pump. Mm. Massive problem. Uh, So so a lot of motion, a lot of movement is one of the keys to health that helps circulate the lymph okay that's good it makes sense that's a part of the world where you have a lot of marathon runners too right that oh yeah you don't want if you're if you signed up and you're thinking you're winning the gold and you're racing against a canyon or density and good luck it's interesting are those two things connected i mean is that the group that you visited with um it's not so much that it's the group it's a little bit of a it's a little bit of an evolution anomaly and that is that um uh, you know, evolution moves very, very slowly um, forward in a sense that, you know, that's a bit of a projection, but but it it, it can move very, very quickly in reverse. And what I mean by that is that, uh, you know, most of us, you know, with slightly paler skin and northern, northern hemisphere people um, left the natural selection game or changed our natural selection game quite dramatically. So you, you, none of your, n- n- no relative you can name four generations back needed to run fast in order to survive. <laughs> they, they just didn't have to right, do that. Right. Whereas in Africa, that has main, that lifestyle has been maintained up until now. And well, so yeah. they've had two or 3,000 years of additional selection based on their speed and their strength and their endurance where we've had, you know, two, 3,000 plus years or even longer where speed and strength and endurance has not been a de- determinant factor in our survival. And as a result, we are, we, we are typically not able to maintain the same level of athleticism as they can when it comes to endurance running. Oh, that's is, and is there biological changes happening here? I'm like, if you look at the genome or if you look at their, um, you know, their, their basic uh, health, you know, how, how, are they different from, you know, an average uh, Westerner? I well, guess. I, I would put it this way: it's not, it's not that they've changed; it's that we have. Right. So what I mean is, is that, you know, they've been living under the the reality of natural selection in the harshest possible environment that you could live. You know, I mean, in, in terms of human existence, like wild animals and having to hunt and no agriculture and what have you. And so they've just maintained the same evolutionary velocity they were already on. Our ancestors, some 15 or 20,000 years ago, uh, started farming and developing agriculture and, and, uh, and, then, and then civilizations and cities and so on. And so we were no longer being selected for that. In fact, we, we basically solved infant mortality where they still deal in, in, in the tribal areas. They still deal with 80% infant mortality. We don't. And so that means that you know, and this is kind of, this is a little harsh, a little, you, you know, I hate to, it, it gets into the political correctness thing, but the reality is, is that, you know, if you have 10 children, like nine of them are definitely going to make it, probably all 10. If they have 10 children, only two are going to make it. And which yes. two? Well, likely the fastest and strongest. And, and you know, and that's, that's the harshness of nature. 
Right, that's the selection process. Uh, yeah. So, so talk a little bit about the distinction between ad- adaptation and evolution, because evolution is a very slow process, and like you said, um, what nature selects for is random mutations. You know, that's it's not something you can really plan on. We can't um, construct our evolution. We think we can, but that's that's hubris. Well, we we actually can. It's just ethically questionable. I, one of my favorite evolution comics ever uh, is a a, a a strong alpha wolf sitting in the snow, staring off into the forest where there's a small glow of a fire in the distance. And the wolf thinks to himself, one night by the fire with the humans, what could possibly go wrong? And then there's a picture <laughs> of a French poodle. Yeah, boy. <laughs> so the truth is we know how to use unnatural selection to create genetic change. But, but of course, you know, we don't do that. You know, theoretically, we don't do that. But, but, the, but you're absolutely right. It's a very slow process when it's completely left to nature. If we manipulate it, we can change dogs into thousands of unbelievably diverse uh, breeds in a few hundred years. They, Actually, um, that's true. They say that's true with vegetables. Every vegetable that we cook, you know, whether it's broccoli or a carrot or a banana, the original form of those things is completely unrecognizable. Yeah. Look at right? bananas. Yeah. It's something people don't understand about what they call GMO foods is that there's a variety <laughs> of, there, there's basically three types of genetic modification. There's the the one, the Frankenstein one that we're afraid of, and that is the the the, the playing with the DNA at the at the brick level. Then there's na- then there's unnatural selection or or genetic modification through breeding, and then there's genetic modification through natural selection. I mean, they're all forms of genetic modification. But Robert, when you were a kid, how big was a strawberry? Yeah, they were little. They were little they were, and delicious, you, like you know, your thumb, big right? And bland. Now you get like apple sized strawberries, which you know <laughs> n- n- maybe isn't ideal. <laughs> Frank, it's Eric, um, you know, when you meet with these tribes, um, you know, they have obviously been exposed to the West. Yeah. And they've, they've, you know, they, they might have a cell phone at the village and, you know, no. they might have solar panels no. and stuff. But no, no, not at all. Um, We're not talking about the Maasai or the Datoga okay. people. Okay. All right. So, but, and, but and to, they're, to they're exposed to Western lifestyle. So why is it that, uh, that they've rejected that is is it is it just because they want to protect their way of life or they made the assessment that you guys aren't really living you know you you guys aren't uh, you know what what where, where does that sort of fit on the spectrum yeah it's a very it's such an important uh, question and distinction so the first thing is to, just to consider the difference between say the Maasai or the Dodoga people and the Hadza the Maasai and the Dodoga people are much more like us than they are the Hadza people they're agriculturalists right. they're pastoralists they have cell phones you know they 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 bank the, the Hadza don't now that's not to say that some of the Hadza have not been co-opted into society. The government has tried for many years to do that, and 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 that's been difficult for them. The missionaries have gone down there and tried to convert them to whatever religion that particular mission was all about, and introduce them to, you know, uh, seed oils and and flour. But uh, uh, there's a very good answer to your question, which is a lesson for us, and that is that if you consider the slow way that we gave up our natural relationship with nature and frankly our instinctive environment if you give, if you consider how slowly we gave it up it, it it was infinitesimally slow if you take a bushman and move them to our lifestyle in a moment our lifestyle is shockingly uncomfortable it's shockingly uncomfortable right. to them. They they get taken into the village. They're shown they can get free food. Free food does lure them in initially. They're like, holy shit, I don't have to hunt for my food every day. But then the next thing you know, it's you have to clean over here. You have right. to, you have to, you have to coexist with other people. There's, you know, and they just, it's shocking to them. Our ancestors gave it up slowly over tens of thousands of years. And no one, no one generation even witnessed what they were giving up. They just kept moving toward what they considered to be progress in an easier life. Which I don't see. Here, here we are living. Let's just say this: we're living in the easiest, safest, best times in the history of Earth for the individual person on Earth today. We have less poverty as a percentage of the planet than ever before. We uh, 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 little girls around the world get eleven years of education to every twelve years that boys get today. It, we are living. It, you can walk down the streets of almost any major city and feel completely safe. Three hundred years ago, if you landed in somebody else's country you probably had serious problems. Now you just hold your, wave your little passport and walk in. We live in the safest times in the history of the world, and yet we have more addiction. We have more uh, uh, pharmaceutical, more uh, psychological illness. intervention. We have more right. alcoholism, and suicide is climbing steadily. This, 
the easier life gets. In other words, more suicide, more heart disease. Yeah. The easier life gets, the harder it is to live it. You know, yeah. Maury Strickman says that, that people medicate themselves when he talks about addiction to substances. What do you think people are medicating themselves for when we take drugs or when we drink uh, in the modern world? What are the circumstances that cause us to seek relief in those substances? Uh, here's a great example. Um, have either of you faced actual death? And I don't mean theoretical traffic thing. I mean, like somebody held a gun to your head or a lion was pouncing or like you, you really, in that moment, you actually believe you're going to die. Mm -hmm. mm, I had an engine failure in an aircraft. <laughs> in an aircraft. Okay. Yeah, so but, here's, but, hey, here's I mean, what I was I've able noticed. to recover it fairly quickly, but you know, I was working the problem before I was thinking that I'm going to die, but yeah. Here's what I've noticed about that. People who had events like that when they were young, they are generally more calm in, in, in tough environments. I was on a plane, oxygen mask drop. We went into a dive. I put my shoes on. I got my passport in my pocket. Everybody else is screaming and crying. I was calm, calm, calm. Why? Well, because as a kid, I went through something where I thought I was going to die. What I mean is, is that your, your, your biochemical emotional responses are calibrated through the course of your life. Your parents faced death more often than you did. Your grandparents faced it exponentially more often than they did. And the next generation and the next generation before. Death, the reality of survival, you, you, every day you, you survived was a lucky day for most of our ancestors. We aren't used to um, fully calibrating our, our adrenals anymore. And so now red and blue lights can flash in your rearview mirror and you flood yourself with adrenaline which is not the appropriate chemical for talking to the police. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So you're saying it's maladaptive. Uh, we've adapted to this sort of sedentary lifestyle and this kind yep. of peaceful, uh, no jeopardy lifestyle. And as a result, we have to kind of artificially stimulate or sedate ourselves um, in order to manage those emotions and those um, hormonal reactions that came about in the old environment, the previous environment. Yeah, I might say it a little differently that we adapted for an incredibly difficult, challenging environment that required yeah. the, 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 that required the, mo the best from us to survive the most difficult things. And now that we don't have that going on, we can see a cockroach and freak out as if it's a lion. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, listen, Eric, what we like to do on the show is um, is uh, after a short break, we're going to talk a little bit more expansively about the future. And we'll talk about the future of human adaptation and, and uh, human evolution. But before we do that, just to get acquainted with you personally, we like to ask some short, quick questions. So these are short answers uh, to give try. us a sense of uh, how you approach this subject matter and where you got started. And so uh, sure. Brett's going to do that. This is the lightning round. Okay, Eric, uh, what technology do you think has most changed humanity? Fire. Yep. Um, that's, uh, that's one we've had before, but we've had the wheel, we've had the fire, we've had computers. Um, is, is there, is, is there a, um, a futurist, a, a, a philosopher, an entrepreneur that has particularly influenced you and why? I think as an entrepreneur, you know, I've had many, um, but the one that I give the most credit to just maybe because of the timing in my life would have been Richard Branson. I, I, I read anything that he would write and I was lucky enough to meet him a few times and he had such a profound impact on my, entre on my life and entrepreneurship that I'm certain that I live the life that I get to live today and explore the things I get to explore today uh, because of his influence. And, and um, do you think that um, Branson's made particularly good um, predictions or forecasts or, you know, what's what's been the secret to his success? You know, I, I don't I don't know his that he has. I think that I think what he's done is um, what, what he did really well in business is identify industries that were that had run the course of time and become institutionalized so that he could compete with them. Um, very well. And often he got that wrong when he tried to compete with Coca-Cola. I mean, that was just a mistake, yeah. you know, that, that was never going to work, but competing against British Airways. Well, I mean, anybody who had the slightest inkling of customer service could compete with British Airways yeah. if they had the capital to do it. So I think that's what he predicted really well. And I think frankly, um, it's, it's not like he's been some timing guru. He's just been really good at, um, creating, uh, um, better circumstances in business environments, and then and then attracting the right people to make those things happen. Great. Um, and is there a science fiction story or um, future that's that's been sort of written or modeled that's most representative of the future that you hope for for humanity? No. All right. No. Cool. I mean, you're going to get back to the past, maybe. Huh? 
Okay, you know, may, maybe the Star Trek universe, you know, may, maybe the Star Trek universe, um, I, I, you know, I often think of, you know, there's there's a lot of conversation like, is capitalism wrong? Is socialism wrong? And I, what I think You've a lot of people don't really understand yeah. is that they they should be just different points on the same timeline, that you have to go a certain distance into capitalism to get to the place that you have enough of the right technology and money in order to move to socialism. And I think that Star Trek kind of, they they depict that well, whether it's whether it'll happen or not. I yeah. that that might be the one. Great. Well, you're listening to the Futurists. We're with Eric Edmeads. We're gonna be right back after this break and we're gonna get into what is the future evolution of the human race given the pressures and situations we find ourselves in. We'll be right back after this break. Provoke Media is proud to sponsor, produce, and support the Futurist Podcast. Provoke.fm is a global podcast network and content creation company with the world's leading fintech podcast and radio show, Breaking Banks. And of course, it's spin-off podcasts, Breaking Banks Europe, Breaking Banks Asia Pacific, and the Fintech Five. But we also produce the official Finnovate podcast, Tech on Reg, Emerge Everywhere, the podcast of the Financial Health Network, and Next Gen Banker. For information about all our podcasts, go to provoke.fm or check out Breaking Banks, the world's number one fintech podcast and radio show. Hey, welcome back to The Futurists. I'm Rob Tursik with my co-host, Brett King. And once again, we're interviewing someone who's doing very good work thinking about and framing new ways to consider the future. This week, we're talking to Eric Edmeads. Uh, who is an entrepreneur, but has a sideline in social anthropology and has been sharing with us his perspectives on evolution and how that's changing. Big topic, nothing small here on The Futurist this week. So Eric, you have a book coming out, uh, a book that's actually right on this topic that we've been discussing. Tell us a little bit about the book. Yeah, the book is called The Evolution Gap. And The Evolution Gap is a gap that I uh, suggest has opened up between our very slow pace of genetic evolution and our capacity for innovation and our accelerating capacity for innovation. And I basically would suggest that almost all pain, suffering, stress, anxiety, disease, and, and frankly, social difficulties, um, uh, you know, stem from that gap. I, it makes sense to me. I mean, I will tell you that there has been this level of hysteria in the last six, last 18 months about artificial intelligence. And, and that's a very funny thing if you think about it, because on the face of it, artificial intelligence is going to confer tremendous advantages on most people, right? It presents a great opportunity, not just for creativity, but the ability to automate away some tedious tasks and so forth. But the universal reaction hasn't been euphoria or excitement or like, wow, what a cool new superpower. Across the board, the reaction has been entirely negative. Um, and mainly, last week we had a guest on the show who said, you can boil it all down to people are worried that they're going to be replaced by a machine. That's the fear that we've got. So the fear is that we're building a machine that's going to replace humanity. What's your perspective on that from an evolutionary standpoint, from a, the super long arc of human evolution? Do you think it's possible for us to build a machine that'll bring us to an end and just uh, wipe us out? Well, having just watched Oppenheimer, I, yes, I think it's absolutely possible oh, to do that. Yeah. Um, Good and, answer. And I suggest that that has probably happened in the universe, that, 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 you know, that, that civilizations have done that to themselves. I, I tend to take a little bit more of a um, you know personal view, and that is let, let's take a look at agriculture for a minute. Now, you and I are hunting, and we come we come back to one of the villages that or one of the campsites that we've often stopped at because we're nomadic people, and we notice that there are vegetables or fruits growing in a place where last year we were eating and throwing stuff, and we're like, wait a second, Robert, you don't suppose we did that? You don't suppose we stimulated <laughs> the growth of that stuff there? And we're like, that's amazing. If we do that, then we won't have to go out there anymore. We won't have to go out into the danger. We can just grow the food near us. Great, let's do that. Okay, so how do you think it works? Well, we just throw the stuff there. Well, actually, you know, in the next generation, we figure out that if we dig a, a hole, and put the seed down and less of the birds, you know, get them. And then we realized, yeah, but then the seeds all died because it didn't like rain enough. So now we figure out that we have to cut some irrigation in and what have you. And pretty soon we are absolute slaves to repetitive stress disorders and injuries. And we've screwed up our nutritional relationship because we're growing foods based on their flavor rather than their nutritional needs. And so we have developed a technology that has given us cancer, heart disease, and diabetes. Now, it didn't happen in one generation. One generation just did things slightly better than the next one. Better being a very subjective idea. And, and so what, what I'm suggesting is that every time we 
make our lives easier. Every time we acquiesce another aspect of our lives to technology, we weaken ourselves dramatically. Now, you probably are aware of this thing about the London cab drivers have the biggest brains in the world. Have you seen that? They have to learn something called the knowledge, which is a four-year degree level education on every street, pub, and restaurant in the 150-year-old exam for taxi it's, drivers. Yeah. It's tough, man. It's tough. But what's interesting is their brains don't grow learning the material. Their, gra- their brains grow accessing it afterward. And so mm. now, how many phone numbers do you know? I bet you it's less than three. But I'll bet you that you and me growing up in the 70s. And, I remember and my you, phone number. When you I knew all of them. And so yeah. now there's an entire part of your brain that you have acquiesced to technology. And now let's take a look that as it stands today, because of the incredible uh, influx of the most disgusting oils and excessive sugar in a non-seasonal way, way, plus the acquiescing of our brain to technology, you and I have a 50% chance of developing uh, dementia in our older age. I, I don't. I think that's a, 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 a result of two things, that we get to live a lot longer because it's a, a safer world, but also because we're living not in accordance with our design specifications. Wow. So is that the premise of the book? Largely, yeah, I would say. Okay. So... Um... Tell me you about do focus on you do focus on the speed of technological development. Yeah, and, I want to hear about that the acceleration. And, and you know, um, you, you you know you you say it, the evolution gap refers to the discord between our genetically ingrained instincts and behaviors, which evolved yeah. over millions of years, and the demands and realities of the modern world that has transformed significantly in just a few generations. So, the reality is, we have never had the uh, you know as rapid the rate of change as we have today. And yep. largely that's because of computing. It's what leads to things like the concept of the singularity, um, you know, and other things like this, because computing power is like, you know, like what you, you're talking about with the agricultural revolution, you know, and then we've got the industrial revolution, then, you know, the uh, computing revolution, we're just about to hit AI. And in each of those, um, you know, we've had to adapt faster because of, of those technologies. So, in the midst of all of this, we also have climate change coming up. So we got massive uh, potential issues with livability of the planet, with access to food, with you know 500 capital cities around the world that are, are going to be inundated by sea level rise. All these things. There's a lot of adaptation that humanity as a as a tribe or a species has to you know um, like adapt to just in the in the next 20 years. So, you know, what are you advocating? That we should well, slow let, down that adoption? We should slow down tech? Or is it... Um, we should you know, increase it, awareness. Okay. So here's a really good example. If, if you're walking along in the wilderness and you drop down into a dry riverbed and you see 14 lions, and I'm saying this as an actual specific example for my own life, you see 14 lions. I can tell you that what happens is you take one sharp inward breath and then you breathe very quietly because you're stressed and you start pumping adrenaline and noradrenaline in your system. And by doing so, you trigger fight, flight, or, 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 or freeze response. Now what happens is you become less intelligent because intelligence is not required in this situation. You don't need to know that the African lion is a largely gregarious family structured. You don't need that shit from David Attenborough. You need to know how many are there? Do they have cubs? Are they dangerous? So your, your intelligence becomes limited to the most basic logic. Your empathy, your empathy um, is in direct opposite proportion to how scared you are. So when you're not the least bit scared, you care about the whole planet. When you're a little bit scared, you care about your country. When you're a little more scared, you care about your community. When you're scared enough, you care only for your family. And if you get scared enough, you will select which child to save. And if you get even scared enough, you will save yourself first. And, and so the, this is just the function of adrenaline. Look, that's why they tell you never go into the water with a drowning person because they can't think. So now understand that that was a great survival mechanism when there were lions attacking you. It was smart that you suddenly had your heart pumping, adrenaline, strength, speed, and basic logic. Now you receive a legal summons in the mail and all those same chemicals pump into you. All of them, the same chemicals, the same chemicals that cause your heart to thunder, that cause your, your, you know, that you start producing blood coagulants to prevent you from bleeding to death before the injuries even mm-hmm. happen. And that happens when you got the letter from the, from the legal summons. And you unless you're planning on getting law, a very right? serious paper cut, it's not helpful. Plus your empathy and intelligence is gone. Should you reply to that letter in that moment? Absolutely not. You're, you're subhuman in that moment. Now, 
And this is just this one is why example. Why people send regrettable emails, right? It's exactly why they send regrettable emails. <laughs> so, so when you when you bring that consciousness to it, you recognize that we have paleolithic nervous systems, paleolithic emotional responses, and we have modern day influences on them. Well, now what we have to do is is bridge that gap and understand that that's what's going on. Here's another example: our ancestors lived in fear all the time. I mean, you you know, we they talk about us like we were massive apex predators and stuff. That's recent. Like we lived in fear of big cats, big cats that hunted us, and 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 it was terrifying. So we're very good at hypervigilance. We're very good at that. Now, if a government wants to seek control of you, all they have to do is frighten you. And the minute they've frightened you enough, you're willing to give up your security, give up your freedom for that implied security. And so, and we've seen a lot of that over the last several thousand or several hundred years, even where you, you frighten the population. The next thing you know, look, I'll acquiesce. I don't need my freedom. I need you to take care of it for yeah, me. The whole war on terror was that, right? It was constantly exactly. reminding us the, the, the terror alert never went below level orange, whatever that means. Oh, yeah. Okay. But now I would even argue, and this is going to be a little, sorry, go ahead. Well, you're making me think of something related here. Um, so I'm listening to this. I'm thinking about the people who are listening to the show, and I'm sure some folks thinking about agency right now. Like, what am I supposed to do with this information? Uh, I don't live in Africa. There aren't 14 lions in my backyard. All we've got in my neighborhood is coyotes and rats. Am I supposed to go out there with my bare hands and catch one of them for dinner tonight? So I guess, what are you proposing? What are people supposed to do with this information? There, there's sort of a process. Look at a symptom and understand that symptom and and then look for the potential evolutionary explanation for it. So one of the examples I use in the book is wisdom teeth. The current wisdom of wisdom teeth is that we simply, that either God or evolution screwed up and gave us these extra teeth that we have to cut out. Now, as much as I understand of God and as much as I understand of evolution, neither are stupid things. So I don't think it's likely that we just evolved these mystery extra teeth or that suddenly our jaws got too small because we weren't chewing. Ridiculous. Here's what really happened. If you go out and ask any hundred people how many of them are missing teeth in the front of their face from some trauma, they'll tell you that, you know, it's, it's, it's a good 20% of people. And we live in the safest times in the history of times. And we wear things to protect our mouths. In the last generation, it was routine to knock your teeth out. And the generation before, very routine. Now, what did our bodies do when we knocked our teeth out? By the way, your teeth are designed to fall out. They're designed to fall out easily if they get traumatized because otherwise the root would break off and you could die from uh, a septic shock. So your teeth, you get jarred, your teeth just fall out. Then what happens next? Your mouth respaces. Your mouth respaces. Now, our ancestors didn't give a damn about their smile. They cared about functional teeth. Their mouth respaced. And here's a fascinating thing. Men are twice as likely to get wisdom teeth as women. And men are twice as likely to suffer face trauma as women. And there's a there is a clear link between trauma and the development of wisdom teeth. Not everybody gets wisdom teeth. Not everybody gets four. Some people get one. Some people get six. So it seems likely that the stimulation of wisdom teeth is facial trauma. Something hits you, your body deduces from that that you may have lost a tooth. As your mouth now starts to respace, it means we need an extra tooth. Now, that's not the problem. That's evolution. It's beautiful. The problem is our egos get involved and say, yeah, but I want my perfect smile. So we stick a denture in there. Now those wisdom teeth, which were called forth by trauma, can't find anywhere to go and they become impacted and they grow in sideways and we have to cut them out. Once you understand that whole process as a, somebody like me who will avoid surgery at every cost if I can, I will not go, you know, I, like I'm not interested in having surgery if, 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 I, if it isn't an absolute must. But once I understood that about wisdom teeth, I'm like, cut them out. It's mm -hmm. that or let my spout, my, my, my face respace and I don't want asymmetrical teeth. So I'll take the surgery. That mechanism that we just described, I believe we need to apply that all over the place. How about racism? Like, here's the deal with racism. If you have a vaguely racist thought, especially if you're you know, one of us, a middle-aged white guy, and you have a vaguely racist thought, you're supposed to condemn yourself. You're supposed to feel horrible and guilty. You're supposed to be a bad person. Except, wait a second, for the vast majority of human history, the people in the next village over were dangerous, but not that dangerous because we traded with them and we swapped children for DNA purposes and so on. But the people that were their neighbors, they were quite dangerous. We're talking 20 miles away. The, the, the Khoisan Bushmen have a tradition. If they bump into a, a, another Khoisan they don't know, they hide behind a rock and they call out looking for common ancestry or else they have to kill each other. Life on earth was precarious and dangerous. And the more somebody looked like you, the less likely it was they were going to kill or rape you. The more different they were from you in terms of their sound, their smell, or their look, the more afraid you were. It is not- Sounds like Florida. 
it's not at all a mystery that people are slightly afraid of people that look different than them. So once you understand that, you go, oh, okay. So racism has this instinct thing. Now we can bring our consciousness in and go, yeah, but I don't have to be an animal. Okay, so you're saying that we can use conscious decision-making. We literally can make right. a choice between known alternatives and choose the option that's m more appropriate for today's circumstances. Do you think that's true across the board? Because earlier I mentioned the, the fact of accelerating technology, right? If we talk to folks from Silicon Valley, we do plenty of that on the show. Uh, they're always rapturous about the idea that the pace of technology innovation is increasing rapidly. And to me, my takeaway is always, yeah, that might be great for you guys because you're going to make a pile of money. But for the rest of us, it feels like we're on the receiving end of something that we never chose or selected. What do you have to say for people who feel like that? I, I have to tell you that um, innovation for the sake of innovation is, is, is not necessarily good or bad. It's what we end up doing with it. You know, in, in 1890 or so, um, I can't think of the author's name now, Emil, somebody wrote a book called Suicide. And in the book, he suggested that if that suicide rates were increasing at that point and that if there was ever a global conflict, suicide rates would go down. He predicted that in 1890. Well, World War I comes along and suicide, to use to mix some bad metaphors, falls off a cliff. Suicide basically stops during World War I comparatively. And then it slowly, over the space of 10 years, it ekes back up again. Then it stops again during World War II. It just stops. Why? Because people define their life experience by having something to fight for. They, they yeah. need trouble and strife. They we need, need the struggle. They right. need the struggle. The, if you make yeah. life too easy for people, they just give up. Ask any teenager what makes them stop playing a video game. If it gets too easy, they'll stop. Mm. And and so incidentally, suicide. But here, here's the thing. The, the struggle is mostly monetary now. And we've got this massive inequality gap. You can't really do much about it, right? Um, you know, because you, you've got to be able to change your, you know, circumstances to to impact that or change policy. And, I, th you know, I, I think there's something, Brett, very important about what you're saying. And I think it's really, this is a, it's a hard thing to say, but it's really important. Again, we live in objectively the very best times that have ever ex existed on earth. And while there is a big wealth gap and what have you, m th there are less people as a percentage of the planet in poverty today than ever before. No, and, no, and I, I, I know that. I mean, look, I know, I know the stats, right? It's the best time to be alive, you know, as a human, um, you know, in, in, in pure historical terms, but let's, Eric, you know, here, here's the part of the show where I really want to get you sort of applying what you've learned over the last 20, 30 years and um, taking us on a journey where you think this might take us. So already, you know, we are starting to, you know, look at gene therapy. We're starting to look at, um, you know, there are mechanisms now where we can understand longevity, cell senescence, uh, these sort of things. We had Aubrey de Grey on the show uh, in, in December um, talking about the, uh, the uh, you know, longevity escape velocity and stuff like this. But looking out 20, 30, um, you know, like the end of this century um, with all of the changes that we're likely to go through over the next few decades, like climate change and AI, how do you think that's going to affect the evolutionary response? How's that going to change humanity? Are we going to sort of become more sustainable, like more like the the Bushmen, uh, you know, and the and the uh, indigenous tribes, or um, you know, do we merge with technology to to get um, uh, over some of these, uh, you know, res uh, autonomic response uh, reactions you talk about? To predict where we're going in five years, let alone at the end of the century, is becoming increasingly impossible. What I would suggest is that where, where we are today is if we do not bring consciousness to this gap, if we don't bring that to the gap, then we're going to cause more problems than we could be begin to understand. And I'll, I'll give you one as an example that was built right into what you said. Are we going to become more like the Hadza people or the indigenous people? Why? Because they know something we don't know? Because they're smarter than us? No, they are us. And, and, and this is a very important distinction. Um, first of all, the, the word indigenous is a politically charged word. The only place there are indigenous people are, is in Africa. Everybody else are Aboriginal. They're, they're not. They're, they're, they are immigrants to those places. Every single other continent, the, the humans evolved, uh, humans migrated to those places. And when they migrated to those places, they obliterated the megafauna. They ate everything that was in their path. They're not better conservationists than us. They don't have a greater understanding of the planet than us. And for us to, go, to, to adopt some James Cameron Pocahontas fairy tale that the answer to our future lies in going back to indigenous people. I was out hunting with the Hadza chief one day. We stumbled upon a hornbill nest. 
A hornbill is Zazu from the Lion King. The way they nest is the female goes into a hole in a cliff or a, a tree, they mud it over, and the male comes and gives her food through the hole until the chicks are alive. We found the nest. The chief breaks the nest open. He grabs the, the mother, breaks her neck, takes the eggs, and we have lunch. And that's the way it is. And I said to him, hold on, do you ever think to leave them? Do you ever think to leave them so that the chicks can grow up and, and become? And he says to me, why on earth would I do that if I don't eat them? Somebody or somebody or something else will. The truth is, is that humans are not evil. We simply want to survive. And if we don't bring our consciousness to this conversation, then as we increase our capacity for technology, we will make life less and less sustainable. Suicide just- but we, 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 can, we can We can make ourselves, um, like for example, we, you know, theoretically, we'll be able to engineer our genes so we can get uh, get rid of all of these germline diseases. We'll we'll be able to build you know sustainable communities with access to you know good food and water. Not the food I'm talking about now, the Franken food that we have uh, you know processed stuff. But you know, assume assume we're going to get better at that. So a lot of those concerns might might disappear, but we still have the problem of suicide and things like that. You're saying so. With all these technological advances, what is it that um, you know that is is that sort of ongoing threat to human evolution? You know, you might have seen a couple of months ago there was some press about some studies done recently on the fact that if you live and spend time near water, that you have less stress chemicals in your body. And you may have been in a Thai restaurant or a spa where there were birds playing. That there were birds playing. Sure. In the, in the, and weirdly, birds playing reduce your stress levels. And the reason they reduce your stress levels is that in Africa, the birds stop singing when the predators come. So the bird singing is an indication to your DNA that you're okay and that you're safe. If we don't understand those basic things, we don't understand them today, by the way, then who the hell is playing with our genome? Because they don't understand those things. They're, 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 they're um, modifying our genome for maximum profitability of the right crops, the same way they did with crops. People said the same things you're saying now, 50 years ago, about how we were gonna genetically modify greens so that, they, so that the insecticides wouldn't kill them and all that kind of stuff. Those innovations, many of them have, have you know, contributed to extra calorie load and, and made it possible for people to get fed, yeah. but those innovations have also caused untold damage to our environment. Okay, so let me see if I can wrap this up. Uh, your comments today um, remind me of Kevin Kelly's comments about living with the Amish and the Mennonites in the United States. Um, and those are cultures that choose not to use technology. They're fully aware of it. They're fully aware of cell phones and so forth. But they make a conscious choice not to adopt the technology. And it's not that they're against technology. They're not Luddites. They're simply not sure what the impact is going to be. And yep. so as a culture, they say, yes, OK, here's this new thing. And that's quite interesting. And we are aware of it. We're going to wait a few years. We might wait 100 years before we decide to adopt it because we want to see what the full impact is going to be. And you're on a mission to spread that wisdom to other people, to take what you've learned in Africa and to tell, share that with people around the world to say, we can make that choice as well. New technology is coming at us faster than ever, but that doesn't mean we have to adopt it we have agency here. We have the ability to select, to make a decision about whether or not we adopt that. Is that the direction you're heading? Is that your four it's, description it's, for the it, future? It's in the theme. I would just say it a little bit differently. It's that when we do adopt technology, we should adopt it with holistic consciousness of the impact. So a friend of mine last night asked me, aren't you afraid that you're acquiescing a lot of your brain when you use AI? And I said, some people are using AI to generate their content. I don't. I use it to ideate. I, I sit and debate with it. I use it to think. So if you use AI to stop thinking, you're going to damage your brain. If you use AI to think and learn faster and do more, then you're doing, mm. you're sending good blood flow to the brain. So as each of these technologies comes along, you have to make a decision. Why on earth in America do you go up a flight of escalators to get to the gym? Yeah. There are times when technology should be adopted consciously and there are times where it just shouldn't be. Always take the stairs, folks. Well, Eric, it's been a great pleasure to have you on the show. Folks who are listening, We'll be interested to learn more about you. Where can they find out about the Evolution Gap and the rest of your work? They can go to theevolutiongap.com and we have an evaluation. You can go to gapfinder.com. It's, it's, uh, we're building that out even now, but even now there's a basic test there that you can identify where gaps ex might exist for you. And, and I'm also at eric.ee. Cool. Thank you very kindly for Fantastic. joining us on the show. It was a lively Thanks conversation. Thanks for having me.
Interesting conversation. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. We'll uh, let us know in the book. I know it's pre order right now, but let us know when the book actually publishes. We'll make sure it gets out on social media as well. Thank you. Super. Thanks for Well, joining folks, us, you've been listening to The Futurist this week. I want to thank Brett, of course, for organizing this show. Thank you, Eric, for being our guest. And thank you to Kevin and the rest of the crew at Provoke. And thanks to our audience for listening. We really do appreciate it. We get a lot of great support and feedback from listeners. And like Brett mentioned in the beginning, we're thrilled to celebrate this milestone of about a year of shows and 500,000 uh, listeners. That's super good news. We've been growing fast and it's with your support. For that, we are deeply grateful. We'll be back in a week with another futurist, someone who is future-minded to help us frame new ways to think more constructively about the future. And of course, until then, we will see you in, in the, the future. future. Well, that's it for The Futurists this week. If you like the show, we sure hope you did. Please subscribe and share it with the people in your community. And don't forget to leave us a five-star review that really helps other people find the show. And you can ping us anytime on Instagram and Twitter at, at Futurist Podcast for the folks that you'd like to see on the show or the questions that you'd like us to ask. Thanks for joining. And as always, we'll see you in the future.